This regularly scheduled school board meeting will be in order. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Chairman, I have one item I would like to add to the agenda, okay. and that is um, Saffle Street School Fundraiser um, to uh, allow candy to be sold um, at one of their events during the day. And we, I would like to add that agenda to the very uh, end of the agenda. Last item under 21, please. Motion to approve the uh, amended agenda, Scott Brown. Second, Steve Carmichael. With first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Peggy Peach. Uh, let the attendance report show that all members except for Ms. Peach are in attendance tonight. Mr. Chairman, could the uh, minutes also say that Peggy's never missed a meeting? Had it not been for the fact that she's in the hospital, she would be here tonight because she just doesn't miss. She loves, she loves service, and she loves the school system, and she loves the kids and the parents that she serves. So, thank you. And I do want to reach out and say that uh, if everybody could please keep her in your prayers. Absolutely. Because um, she is in the hospital, so. Uh, can I get an approval for the uh, to adopt the March 11th, 2024 regular uh, meeting minutes, uh, along with let's see, uh, along with the March 18th special called meeting? Motion to approve, Scott Brown. Second, Steve Carmichael. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. Thanks, Sergeant. Yeah. Uh, financial report. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Very good. For our March financial report, uh, in terms of revenue, you're going to see a 1.3% decrease in revenues from March 23 to March 24. That decrease is due to an approximate 600,000 or 3.1% increase in tax receipts. However, combined with our lower beginning balance, we are seeing a 1.3% decrease overall. We do continue to see increased revenues from motor vehicle taxes, as well as income from interest on our investments. Motor vehicle revenue increased approximately $40,000 from the prior year. In our money market account, um, we have increased our interest income to $266,000 year to year. Additionally, this month we saw an increase of approximately $640,000 in our property tax revenue from the prior year. And we do continue to see an approximately 3% decrease in our SEEK revenue. Uh, and at this point, that represents about a $299,000 reduction so far. In terms of expenditures, our salary and benefit costs show an increase of 3.1% which is definitely reasonable based on the step and 3% raise approved in April. Our non-salary expenditures have increased 14.2% from the prior year. And as I've noted previously, we continue to see increased costs for operational supplies as well as a substantial increase in our property insurance. If anyone doesn't have any questions, I'm gonna go back on mute. Any questions? If there's no questions, can I get a motion? Motion to approve, Steve Carmichael. Second. With a first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Uh, orders of the treasurer. Any questions regarding the orders? If there's no questions, can I get a motion? Motion to approve, Scott Brown. Second, Steve Carmichael. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. A superintendent report. Thank you.
to welcome everyone. It's great to look out and see so many children and families and parents and community members um, and other family members here to support our students as well as our um, teachers. Um, welcome to the April 8th board meeting and welcome to everyone online as well. I have a very special group um, to recognize this evening. The Robert B. Turner academic team is our first recognition. Principal Jason Alexander and I are excited to recognize and welcome the Robert B. Turner academic team students, families, as well as the coaches. Had Coach Sarah Wallace, where's Miss Wallace? She's down there, I see her, Miss Wallace, thank you. And assistant coaches Caitlin Smith and Miss Elizabeth Harris have provided us with all of the achievements of this exceptional group of students that we'd like to share with you tonight. First, we'd like to thank our students for your hard work and focus on academic excellence. You make us proud every single day. Students, when I call your name, please come forward. We will clap for them as they come forward, but we will also give them a great big um, ending round of applause as well. Coaches, as well as uh, Mr. Principal Alexander, if you all have things you'd like to say at the end, I'll also um, ask you if you'd like to do that as well. All right. First, district recognitions for each written academic assessment. Social studies, we had two students tie for third place at district, Kyle Lewis and Addison Hagen. Let's give them a round of applause. Congratulations. In first place, Miss Lillian Wilcher. Math, we also had a tie for third place, Josiah Wells and Wyatt Shiflett. Let's give them a round of applause. In first place, Lane Henderson. <laughs> Language Arts. We had a tie for fifth place. Um, Piper Sanders and Wyatt Shiflett. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> In fourth place, Kenzie Goff. Science, fifth place, Lane Henderson. And first place, Miss Katie Beckman. Right here. Arts and Humanities is our next category. And we had fifth place, Lane Henderson. Third place, Carly Merritt. In first place, Miss Anna Warren Nesbitt. <laughs> our next category is our composition category, which is our writing category. And we had our fourth place winner, Robert B. Turner, Miss Lillian Wilcher. <laughs> the next two categories are team events and it's pretty awesome um, to have a team work closely together to overall reach first place as a group and as a team. Um, the first group is called the future problem solving team and they're given an event and um, they have to come up with the best solution and they get scored on that and so our future problem solving team for Robert B. Turner at District placed first and we had these folks on that team. Ella Dial, Kate Buckman, Piper Sanders, Riley Godessa. The last group is a really hard one. It makes everybody nervous because it, it, it's it's a uh, it's a quick recall team, and so you are put on the spot. You have buzzers. You have to chime in. Try to be the first person to chime in. Get the correct answer. It's really. Um, super awesome. Did I leave somebody out? Avery Jury. I apologize. I'm sorry, Miss Avery. Congratulations. Thank you for telling us and sending her up. But quick recall is very hard and challenging. So this group is undefeated. 
that's pretty awesome to be undefeated. Um, and they won first place, of course, and um, the students on that team are Carly Merritt, <laughs> Josiah Wells, <laughs> Lane Henderson, <laughs> Kenzie Goff, <laughs> Anna Warren Nesbitt, <laughs> Kyle Lewis. Addison Hagen, Lillian Wilcher, Avery Drury, and Wyatt Shiflett. Again, I can't stress how hard it is to be undefeated and how um, impressive it is for this group to, uh, to be undefeated. Uh, at regional comp or excuse me, at um, the next phase of the competition is the regional. So you have state, or excuse me, you have district first, then you have regional. I don't believe we have state competition for um, elementary level, but um, at the region is where our students also participated. And in science, we had uh, a regional winner, fourth place, Lane Henderson. <laughs> and in math, we had a fifth place winner, and that's Josiah Wells. Our future problem solving team won first place at regionals, and this is awesome. So they competed against 33 other regional teams, and this week or next week, this week, next week, next Monday, we find out if they rank in the top 10. So let's give them another big, huge round of applause for that accomplishment. So if they win in the top 10, we'll bring them back for, for pretty awesome recognition for getting the top 10, because that's pretty amazing. Um, Let's see. Future problem solving, again, won first place at regional. I already said future problem solving. Overall, Robert B. Turner placed fourth out of 17 schools. So let's give them a great big round of applause as well. <laughs> but there's a special award that this team won, and the special award is the Sportsmanship Award. And um, Mr. Alexander and all the teachers and staff and, and parents and families and students know what it means to be a Titan. And so um, exhibiting um, all the qualities of a Titan um, is what always makes the Titan so special. And so they were nominated and voted upon by their peers, by the teams of students um, at the competition, and they won the Sportsmanship Award. So let's give them a great big round of applause for that. They are all true titans, and other teams recognize them um, for this as a team. So exhibiting the actions of true titans. So congratulations. Your accomplishments are to be commended, and they are recognized. We're so proud of each of you for your hard work, your accomplishments individually and as a team. Congratulations, Robert B. Turner, Titan Academic Team. Please join me in giving this amazing team a great big round of applause for their amazing accomplishments. Parents, thank you all for being there, helping your students prepare, supporting your students, and supporting um, the, uh, the staff at Robert B. Turner as well. Principal Alexander and our coaches, would you all like to come? Please come down, our coaches. Miss Wallace, uh, look at them. You all come on down. That's okay. I just want to say just real quickly how proud I am of, of the kids. Guys, you all, you all represented us so well, and I couldn't be more proud of you all um, and your accomplishments, especially the Sportsmanship Award. That was awesome. So I'm just grateful for you guys. You guys just uh, made it look easy. You're a good team. You're, you had fun, and that's what it's all about. And this is something that you'll remember for, for the rest of your life. Coaches, Ms. Wallace. Ms. Harris and Ms. Smith, thank you for your hard work and dedication and always preparing our kids uh, in a mighty way and to be true titans. So proud of you. You deserve it. You good? <laughs> All right.
if we would just bring our coaches up here to get a picture with you all, would that be okay? We'll do one picture um, with all of our students, Mr. Ale Principal Alexander and our coaches, that'd be great. Mr. Murphy, would you take a picture for us, please? Mr. Murphy, would you take a picture for us, please? Thank you. the round of applause as we send them back now. Thank you all. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. I have another student group that I would like to recognize. They're not here this evening. We just got this information today and I'm so very proud and I couldn't wait to announce um, that we do have um, STLP two, um, one state champion and one state runner up, which is pretty awesome. So. Uh, Principal Glass, um, Mr. Stephen McCake, who is our technology teacher at Anderson County High School, and I are very proud um, to recognize and announce um, the Cypher Cats, who are state champions at the state S STLP uh, competition in game design. Let's give them a big round of applause for winning the state. <laughs> and then our second place state runner up for web design. Let's give those students a round of applause as well. Principal Glass and um, our CIO, Mr. Blake Jury, will have them back next month and we will officially recognize them for their amazing accomplishments. We also had the drone team that did super well at the high school. We're going to bring them back. They did not win the state, but they just barely missed uh, the cut for, um, for their work as well. So we're very, very, very proud of them as well. My last um, recognition is very special. Um, it is always so um, such an honor to do the teacher, the Anderson County Teachers of the Year. And so our 2024 um, Teachers of the Year are a very, very special group of dedicated teachers um, who work hard daily to earn their titles. Um, 2024 Anderson County Teachers of the Year. It is an honor to be selected among the district's master teachers who lead with grace every single day. Teachers of the Year Ex exhibit strong work ethic, build strong student relationships, teach students through their actions every day how to be good role models and just good people in general. They work collaboratively with students, parents, families, and each other. They take pride in being educators, and they love our children. It is with great honor to announce and congratulate each of our 2024 Anderson County by school teachers of the year. So I'm going to call your name, teacher of the year. I'm going to ask you to come forward as I read a little bit about you and then your building principal is also going to come forward, stand by you and say a little bit about you as well. Okay. So when I call your name, please come forward. First, we have Anderson County High School, Miss Lauren Keller was hired mid-year in 2017, and this is her seventh full year, school year, teaching social studies at Anderson County High School, and her second year helping to plan the district-wide professional development conference. You can bring them up, please do. Please do. Oh, please do. Yes, all is right with the world in the hands of a mama, right? As a parent, I can say my daughter loved you as much as your daughter does. Um, you built strong relationships with my personal daughter, and I want to thank you for that. Um, you taught her engaging lessons. Uh, thank you for coming up, too. Um, you made every day a great day to learn social studies for my daughter. You even sent her text messages whenever you saw her out, and that means so much to me as a mom. So thank you for that. Thank you for being so kind to my daughter and for all of the students in Anderson County High School. Congratulations, Ms. Keller. Well deserved. Let's give her a great big round of applause.
that's what happens when kids leave her classroom. They cry because they want to go back to learn more. No, um, she's not only a, a great, outstanding teacher. Um, if you walk in Lauren's classroom any day, you're going to see just amazing things happening. She's done a great job with our AP US program. Um, as you guys know, for a rural school, we have one of the best AP programs in the state of Kentucky, and she's one of the reasons why. Um, she's a leader in, our, in my building. Uh, you know, if I go in, I'm going to see kids engaged. I'm going to see them interested in what's going on. Uh, I'm going to send genuine, true, loving relationships between her kids and her. And um, what she does in the classroom is just amazing. And I cannot speak enough. Um, you know, it's some, I, would, I would love to go back in the classroom and say I was half as good as what Lauren is in the classroom. Uh, she's fabulous, and what she does is wonderful, and she is just a true asset to our building and is a great leader and is going to be a great leader in this district for years to come. So, thank you. Next, from Anderson County Middle School, Miss Heather Case has 25 dedicated years of teaching and 24 years at Anderson County Middle School. Miss Case has been a great role model for students and staff alike with her innovative and engaging lessons, positive attitude, and willingness to help in any way. Congratulations, Miss Case. Well deserved. Give her a great big round of applause. So I've had the privilege of working with Miss Case during the past 11 years of her 25, um, and she's taken on a variety of roles within Anderson County Middle School. Whether she is delivering a lesson in her own classroom, collaborating with other teachers in another classroom, working with students in small groups during the school day and after school hours as well, or even working gates at basketball games for not only middle school but high school events as well. Um, the passion she has for her students is evident in everything that you do, and it feeds over into other staff as well. She's very solution-oriented, um, always seeking to use strategies that will grow all students. Um, she doesn't give up on something when we try something new, no matter how challenging it is. She seeks to find a way to make it work and benefit every child. She currently teaches uh, sixth grade language arts, which is an academically diverse group of students that merge from our elementary schools here in Anderson County. So that's a very important class. It's a very important grade level uh, for their future as a student in grades six through 12. The culture of learning is established with clearly defined and very high expectations as they enter the middle school through Ms. Case's class. Not just academically, but also in how students learn to interact with each other, the culture of blending new students together from the three different schools. She has the ability to reach students at all levels, move her students onto higher levels in ways that foster growth to the whole student. She's just got that knack for connecting with students. When I ask the students some of the things that they love about Ms. Case and her classroom, the words they shared were, she makes learning fun and that they know she cares about her every day because if they need something, she's the one that they'll go to to get help. She always makes sure they have it. She'll fight for them. She'll care for them. She nurtures them. She's just nice to them and loves them all. There are no truer words that could have been spoken. Thank you, Ms. Case, for all you do for the teachers and the kids at the middle school. We appreciate you. Next is Saffle Street. 
Um, Ms. Katie Gonzalez is in her 13th year with Anderson County Schools. She began her career as a preschool teacher at Sparrow Early Childhood Center in 2011 and later became a special education teacher, which we're so grateful for in 2020 at Saffle Street Elementary. She loves all children. Some days are harder than others, but she makes every day count for students and always reminds them that she loves them no matter what. Congratulations, Ms. Gonzalez. Ms. Gonzalez, so very well deserved. So where do I even start with describing Miss Katie Gonzalez, um, the true definition of our Teacher of the Year for Saffle Street Elementary? She's dedicated, she's an inspiration, she's compassionate, she's innovative, she's a role model, she's motivating, she's encouraging, she's supportive, she's passionate, and I could go on and on, but most of all, we know that she loves her kids. She loves all the kids of Saffle Street. A couple colleagues also asked me to share a few couple encouraging words congratulating Miss Katie on her, on her Teacher of the Year. I'm so grateful for Katie's positive influence on my life. She has the patience of a saint. Anyone who gets a chance to work with her should consider it a bl true blessing. She smiles even on the toughest days. Nobody's more deserving than Miss Katie Gonzalez. Another staff member said, Katie Gonzalez could not be more deserving of this award. She's the purest definition of what Anderson County Public School stands for in our dedication to children. She helps to ensure students have the emotional stamina to learn and engage in their classrooms and collaborates with all the Saffle staff to ensure support is provided in this manner across our building. We're so blessed and we're honored to have Ms. Katie Gonzalez as our own and we congratulate you on Teacher of the Year. Next is Emma B. Ward Elementary. Ms. Maggie Smith is a special education teacher and began her career in 2018 in Anderson County. This is her sixth year with Anderson County Schools, serving a total of eight years. Ms. Maggie has the patience of Job and works with every student with such care and grace. She loves teaching students and is a role model for everyone. She is one of the best EBD teachers, or excuse me, emotionally behaviorally this challenged uh, teachers that I've had the pleasure to know. Congratulations, Ms. Smith. So very well deserved. Let's give her a big round. I know, I know, I know. I am so honored to get to work with Ms. Smith each and every day. Um, she is so deserving of this honor, um, and our staff voted um, on the staff member for this award, so um, our staff sees that in you as well. So we are so thankful for you. Um, but Ms. Smith, is, she is so humble, and she is such a silent leader um, within our building. Um, she will go above and beyond not only for the students in her classroom, but for her colleagues and other students within our building. Um, she is not only a great asset to Emma B. Ward, but she's a great asset to Anderson County Schools. Um, with her wealth of knowledge, the passion that she has for her students, um, and the dedication to continuing to learn. Um, so some of the things our staff wrote about Ms. Smith, she always has a smile on her face, even on the hardest days. Um, you would never know that it's a hard day when you go into Ms. Smith's room. Um, she is one of the most resourceful teachers I have ever worked with, always looking for and utilizing resources um, through local avenues, through different universities, grants, outside agencies, uh, research projects. Um, if there's a resource out there, Ms. Smith will find it um, to benefit her students. 
She's always growing her students and those students are thriving in her classroom. Um, and she is such an advocate for her students to participate in the general education setting. Um, I strive to be more like Ms. Smith each and every day, so I'm so thankful that you're at Emma B. So congratulations. Next, we have Robert B. Turner, Ms. Shelby Stratton is in her eighth year with Anderson County Schools teaching primary students. She is a very quiet role model for everyone. She is described as a master teacher who is always willing to help colleagues, loves all students, and is always learning. Videos of her are always shared. You probably don't know that, but I see plenty of videos with you doing all of the work, and I love that. Um, to share new ideas and strategies uh, as well as the resources that you've been given. She's not afraid to try new ideas and is always role modeling how to be a Titan. Congratulations, Ms. Stratton. So well deserved. Let's give her a round of applause. So I feel a little old because I actually was on site base when Mr. Reese hired Ms. Stratton. So was it eight years ago now? And um, I just remember then just, you know, she's right out of school um, and just thinking she's going to be, she's going to be a great teacher. And that's exactly uh, what she is. Very well deserving of teacher of the year. All the things that Ms. Mitchell said are 100% true. Um, she's a leader within our school, just always positive, always smiling and just willing to do whatever it takes uh, to make it happen, and definitely a, a, a true titan, and just proud of you. Uh, it's been really awesome now as principal to see her grow, uh, not only as a teacher, but just as a leader within our school. She's been on our uh, ICLE model schools um, team. She's a team leader, a leadership team. She's just really willing to do uh, whatever it takes uh, to make it happen, and I couldn't be more proud of you and just grateful uh, that you're a Titan. One of the things that I do want to share, though, sorry, I'm not going to take up too much time, but we also have staff vote as well. And so she receives votes every year, and I want to read one. I've shared a couple with you already, but I want to read one here. This says, although I've never seen Miss Stratton teach, I know she, she is a phenomenal teacher. Anytime you see her, she has a smile on her face. You can tell she is very passionate about her job. Also, her previous students love her. She builds great relationships with her students, which is key to being a successful teacher. Ms. Stratton is a perfect example of what a great teacher is. Passionate, caring, and helpful. And I couldn't agree more. Very deserving, proud of you. Thank you for being a Titan. Last but most certainly not least, we have our Sparrow Early Childhood Center, Miss Beth Murphy. She's a speech pathologist at ECC and began in 2018. This is her sixth year with Anderson County Schools and her 14th year in public education. She has served on the SPDM Council and is so well respected as a teacher leader. She is described as very knowledgeable, professional, and loves her students. After working with Miss Murphy as an SPDM member, I would also describe her as very thorough and just a top-notch teacher who is passionate about early childhood learning as well as public education. Congratulations, Miss Murphy, so very well deserved. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is my favorite board meeting of the year because we get to celebrate teachers. Um, the greatest things in my life besides teaching students, besides my family, teaching, in my career, teaching students has been able to coach and mentor teachers. So I value that highly. Um, 
I'm an oldie in the district, I'm a veteran, and I've been around a long time, and I look around this room, and I just want to say to parents, our, t our kids are in good hands when you look at these teachers. Um, Katie, I was there when you started out at ECC. Your heart, your hard work, and who you are, we still haven't been able to replace that hole that you left in our school, Katie. I look back at Shelby Stratton, your first year, Mr. Reese, he hired you and he had me coach you in kindergarten. And he said, what do you think about this one? And I said, did you see her data? Do you see how she moved kids? And, you, and I got to be your teammate for four and a half years at Turner. And you, you just kept growing and you're just wonderful. Maggie, you graduated, I saw you graduate high school. I saw you graduate college. I remember your first day student teaching in Fayette County. And now you mentor not only my daughter-in-law, as her as a first year you share your knowledge your heart you mentor teachers at my school i appreciate you so much you're wonderful lauren has always been an overachiever it doesn't surprise me she's an overachiever in teaching and heather case you and i were one of the oldies around we've done a lot of things together and you still you hang in there and you keep working hard for kids and now i get to i know don't put me here now um i just value you all and the next thing I get to talk about, Beth Murphy. I, of course, she's a speech language, language pathologist. And, you know, we used to say speech teacher. She is an expert in her field, that goes without saying. She differentiates, she meets the needs of her students. But y'all, I'm a, I'm a strong person of faith. And I wish in my life, first of all, that I would serve God and I would serve others. But in doing that, you have to have a servant's heart, right? The biggest compliment, the people I look up to in my life are people with servant's heart. And Beth Murphy has a servant's heart. I look at Beth and I'm like, I wish I could be like you. Beth serves our students. She serves our district. She serves her fellow teachers. In everything that you would want to walk in a school and see someone do, Beth Murphy does whether that is to comfort a child, to offer a child a smile when they need it, to um, when she hears the radio go off and she knows there's a need in the school, she goes. Um, when we're shorthanded, she's like, what can I do to help? In every way, she is there. And we also get feedback from my teachers. It's the, I ultimately choose. It's not a popularity contest. Beth got teacher of the year at Sparrow Early Childhood Center, not because she's liked, because she is liked, but she is overwhelmingly respected. And so it's my pleasure just to congratulate you as the Sparrow Early Childhood Center Teacher of the Year, Beth. Thank you all. If I could just have you all stay and have all of our teachers of the year with your principal, please come forward. Let's get one picture of all of our teachers of the year with their principals, please. The little ones can come, please. <laughs> Let's give them one more great big round of applause and say thank you. <laughs> Chairman, that's all I have this evening. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
great it is. It isn't the buildings or anything else. It's the employees. And I personally like to thank each one of you all for what y'all do every day. And I'm proud to be able to go across this state with my job and say I'm from Anderson, Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. I think we all uh, have to second that one. So, uh, up next, we have uh, comments for the visitors. Uh, we ask each to uh, keep it to about two or three minutes. Um, uh, first up, we have uh, Mr. Ed Garin. Two-time federal whistleblower, I will 
Thank you, Mr. Gelling. Next up, we have Dr. Anissa Penn Davis. Hi, I'm Dr. Anissa Penn Davis. I'm president of the Anderson County Education Association. Sorry I missed uh, last month's board meeting. My dad was in ICU for 23 days, and so still dealing with, still dealing with all of that. Um, it is April. You know what we're going to talk about? Money. Uh, some districts are coming in hot, strong, and we need to compete. Um, you may not think that you're competing with some of these districts, but in reality, Anderson County is competing with every district within an hour's drive. We know we have teachers that live here that drive to Jefferson County. We know we have teachers here that drive to Shelby County. So driving uh, is not always a deterrent. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of the budget. Um, I've been asking for months, and actually he's been talking to you all for the last year, about 3% in a step. Uh, there are some districts that are coming in at 5% in a step. Um, but I truly think that over the years, you have shown that you create a budget that supports a 3% in a step. You're able to do it. You find the money. You make it work. Because that is your way to show staff in this district, teachers, classified, everybody, this is your way to show staff in this district that you value what we bring to the table. Okay. He said he has five college degrees. He's not the only one in the room. So we bring a lot to the table. And the way you structure the budget shows us how much you respect us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, next up, we have the construction payments, uh, payment summary project BG 23-130, Anderson County Middle School and Saffle. Uh, it's consideration to approve the following payments uh, as outlined in payment summary uh, number six for Anderson County Middle School and Saffle Elementary project BG 23-130. Um, I'll let you all look through the each line item there, but it totals uh, $804,016.78. There's no questions. Motion to approve. Scott Bram. Second, Steve Carmichael. With a first and second. Can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Uh, payments to Ross Torrent Architects. Uh, consideration to approve the following payments to Ross Torrent Architects uh, for March 2024 services performed uh, on the following projects. Um, Saffle Structural Repairs, uh, the uh, KF ICS and DFP services, uh, and Anderson County Middle School slash uh, Saffle Street Elementary HVAC uh, projects. A uh, totaling of amount of fourteen thousand two hundred and twenty nine dollars and sixty one cents. Second, Scott Brown. With a first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Uh, Saffle Street Cafeteria. Uh, restructure project, a consideration to approve the following uh, options. Uh, approval award of consideration and contract for the Saville Street uh, Cafeteria Structural Repairs for base bid $438,890 to B&R Construction, LLC. This award is based uh, on the bid opening uh, April 4th, 2024. Uh, number two, consideration to approve uh, alternate uh, number one uh, in the amount of $117,558 to B&R Construction, LLC. This award is based on the bid opening uh, of April 4th, 2024. 
uh, number three, consideration to re uh, reject the bid, redesign the documents, and rebid. This would uh, appro be approximately a two-month delay. Uh, and number four, vote to enter post-bid negotiations with BNR Construction LLC with the intent uh, to value engineer portions of the project. And before we get into that, right. those are big numbers. They are very big numbers. And I am very sorry to be the bearer of such disappointing news for this project. Uh, we had discussions. So first off, there was one, only one bidder for this. There were two other contractors who had picked up documents. Um, we had been in conversation with all of them, uh, but uh, they declined to submit a bid. Um, some of the reasons they gave were, were the size of the project. Uh, the project is uh, relatively small. Uh, it's also a bit tedious in that there are several subs that have extremely small scopes of work. So that results in a small project increase, which we hate to say that, but um, so we did have one better uh, who I do feel is a uh, competent and uh, a good contractor. He cited uh, that there has been a, a large increase in the cost of concrete. We do have some concrete in this project in the last several months, uh, metal panels, which are uh, the exterior siding that we have specified, uh, that just across the board, metal panels have, a, have an increased cost. But a lot of it is the size of the project and the carefulness that has to be undertaken with the demolition of the walls um, while maintaining the structural steel in place. So the base bid um, is, a, a, you know, the, the cost of that it, uh, reflects those things. The alternate has a great deal of concrete in it. That's uh, probably where most of that is. And again, the small aspect of it. Um, it just seems ironic to say it's a small project and that's why it's so expensive, which is disappointing. Um, I have been in conversation with our structural engineer. Uh, we did talk about were there options that we could uh, think about this in a slightly different way. Uh, we talked through several different back and forth. Um, we do not feel that there is m many other options as far as the steel bracing in the wall, nor is there options to, to not take down the CMU and the masonry walls, which um, present kind of their own problem with the cracking. Uh, and so, um, you know, there, there could be the possibility of taking out a bit of the uh, concrete for the slab, interior slab. The interior slab has pulled away from the stem walls, but that also would, I, I don't know that there's gonna be huge amounts of savings if we were to reject and to redesign. I'm not sure that, it, it's really a very bare bones project. There, there's only so many things that you you can do. So when Ms. Mitchell and I spoke on the phone right after the bid, you know, I said, let's look at all of th these three options. And since then, I have had several conversations with others in our office, as well as the structural engineer. And so I, I am not sure that a redesign would result in much less of a project to bid, to bid you know, that would lower the price. The other concern that we have is this time of year, 
the number of projects that are out there uh, indicate that the, we may not get more bidders, we may not even give one bidder to rebid. That's not something, I mean, we obviously call people to try to gain interest and to let everyone know, um, you know, that there's a project out there. Uh, but there is always that concern. We don't have control over who will bid the project or if they will bid the project. So um, there, I think there might be some slight savings in kind of if, if you choose to approve and accept this, I think that there might be a little bit of savings of taking out some of the concrete, um, but I don't think it's gonna be very remarkable. I want a friend looked at the looked at it before y'all started, and I didn't see any cracks at all in the brick. So yes, there. The only crack in the brick. So, the issue with that is, the brick is tied to the interior CMU. That is how mm -hmm. that system works. So we can't take down just the interior CMU, we have to take down the brick on the outside too because the brick is being supported by that CMU. There is the only cracks on the, uh, on the exterior brick are over one of the windows on the inside side that's closest to the, uh, the other wing of the build <clears throat> building, classroom wing, um, and it's, uh, but yes, there are not that many exterior cracks, which. I'm not an engineer, but I'm in, in construction all my life. And that's uh, my, my point is that it looks like to me that the, the block the way it's cantilevered out has caused the block to creel. And if you took the weight off the block, it wouldn't creel anymore. And so we just put a wall in front of that wall and still stood it up in between the, the purlins and reinforce it that way. To, to build an interior wall. Yeah. Um, Hold the I, roof up, take the load off the block. Right. Put it on the steel structure and to tie it into the footer. Mm -hmm. And that would, that would fix it and it, I would think it would come in with at least half the price maybe, I don't know. That, that could be. That, uh, we did not discuss that mm. as, as an option. So that, that could be something that we would, uh, you know, we could explore. I just wanted to make you aware that that is a distinct possibility. That was the uh, many of the concerns that were voiced in our office as we were talking. Uh, I was talking with the other architects in the office and other, you know, um, partners. I was 
Yes, I agree. It's frugal. <laughs> so it, it is very important that we, you know, everyone is cognizant of, of, the, of being good stewards of, of this. I'm, I don't have a magic bullet or a perfect answer on which way to go. So, but I, I do feel like it's either a, a reject and redesign, uh, but there will be a time delay and it is a inconvenience for that space not to be, um, be able to be utilized. If we were to enter into um, post-bid negotiations, I'm, I'm, I'm like Scott, I think there's uh, other ways to skin this cat. Um, I, I think there's some different engineering that can be thought outside of the box. Um, I definitely don't want a two month delay. Um, with rebidding and then worrying who, who's actually going to bid. Um, I'm, I'm leaning towards the negotiations um, and seeing if we can work with them since it already has been set out um, and let's just see where we can cut and how we can change things around. Um, I mean, that's just, that's just me. I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of on Sarge's level here. I'm pretty frugal, um, especially when I saw that number. <laughs> I, I don't, th this is the one thing of the, the meeting that, that I, we I won't know about. what that number will be. I know. And, and so that's you know, we have to kind of work through that. So that the benefit of rejecting, and I'm not advocating one or the other. No, I get it. I'm just, the, the benefits of, of rejecting, redesign, and rebid is that then you have a number that you know it will be built for. Um, and the other way is through a series of essentially change orders um, and we love those. Don't we? Right. <laughs> that's always pleasant conversation. But knowing that that's coming is, is another thing. But we don't, we wouldn't know what those amounts would be t until we could work through, uh, you know, we would propose changes. The contractor would then give us what the price deduct would be from the original contract and that would come to you as a change order to uh, hopefully deduct some portion of this cost, but we would not know what that would be until we went through that process. Your throw wouldn't be a whole lot. No. I, I would not count on that it would be sub substantial. A two month delay, we're pushing into next year, aren't we? Yeah, next school year. We got to consider that too. You know, if we're going to have her work on it for a longer period of time, then we better pay pay what we pay her. Right. Any draft. 
I'm just usually honest and upfront. These three know much more about construction type projects than I do. So I'll just, I'll just ask, what, what's, what are the possibilities of a post-bid negotiation with BNR Construction? Are they willing to incorporate or at least listen to some of the things that Scott was talking about, about reinforcing and raising? Or is that a consideration or you think these folks are not interested in a project even smaller than, than what we're talking about? Um, we would, uh, we could approach them on that. I, th I think they would be willing to do some changes uh, to, you know, to, yes, I think they would be willing to do that. I think all four, all five of us are very frugal when it comes to spending taxpayer dollars, and, and we all want to be that way. And, I, and we do know that teacher, you know, teacher yes. salary raises steps, those things are really important to us, and we understand Agreed. the value of our staff. Yes. Um, but is that possible to get some kind of a response from these folks, whether they would be willing to, to at least discuss that with us? And again, I think Scott's idea of maybe raising and reinforcing, I don't know how, what kind of an impact that would have on the job and how much that would still give them an, an opportunity right. to do the job at a, at a cost that maybe we could swallow a little bit easier. And, it, and that may be, you know, we may need to have that discussion as a special call or a work session to uh, make sure that everyone is amenable to that. We, we vote on entering the post bid negotiation. They can negotiate and see what they can come back with, I guess. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> but it work. Yes. Okay. Well, and then you could later reject if you wanted to, Suzanne. <clears throat> that's what I would be willing, that's what I would want to know the answer to before. I think they would want to know the answer to that before that. Decision. I am not for certain what the parameters of that would, if there was a, would be an option to reject it then if the price did not come within. Right. Okay. That's yeah. what that's what I was asking. Thank you. <clears throat> that's Kind of a, not again, asking because I don't know. What kind of a time frame are you under? Is I mean, I know you said this could push the project back two months. I mean, is this something that you could have if, an answer in a week or two weeks, and whether somebody's willing to do that, or is that too much of an expectation that in two weeks or three weeks you could have an answer? I think in about two weeks we could have a better idea uh, of another direction and a and a possible cost. Uh, sure. I think that, that how that would affect. <laughs> worth consideration uh, I think for me that's 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 where I'm that's where I'd go for and be open for us a, a uh, special called session to, um, for them to be able to for us to be able to reject if it doesn't come back and or if something goes crazy I make a motion, with it, so. Scott Brown for number four to try to renegotiate and restructure I'll second Steve Carmichael with a first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Structural monitoring uh, extension. Um, consideration to extend the monitoring of cracks at Anderson County Middle School and Saffle Elementary by six more visits uh, at the contracted rate cost of $1,200 per visit uh, for a total of $7,200. So I just uh, wanted to add information to that request. Uh, the initial contract with the special inspections group ran out at the end of the number of times that they would observe and and take documentation of the cracks. Yeah. Uh, in discussion with our structural engineer, they felt that w it would be very useful uh, to have uh, a few more months of documentation, given that uh, that would then uh, show all seasons uh, because there are some some movement, there has been some movement in some of the cracks, 
Uh, it has not been progressive. There's been movement and then no movement. And so they want to know uh, if the seasons being freeze thaw, more water in the ground, at drying during the summer months, that that would uh, change, would that, would it stabilize or would, they could then determine if it's a seasonal thing or if it's a progressive structural uh, movement. So basically we've seen the We've seen the freeze part, but we haven't seen the right. We haven't seen the storms, the, the, the wet part, <laughs> and the uh, more dry. I mean, wet, yes, but yeah. it just <clears throat> that was their recommendation, and so I wanted to go ahead and get that in front of you so that we could then continue with. Uh, we also the the original contract has a per visit uh, cost, um, and so if we want to do that month to month, or but this was the re recommendation of, of three more months. Yes, you did. It makes it makes sense to me, and it's it's something you can't tell looking at the crack a chicken a week later if it's going to anything else. So, I mean, I've seen cracks in houses be big enough you can put your finger in, and it rains and it goes back together. So, I make a motion to approve Scott Brown. I'll second it, and then I'll kind of add to to uh, Mr. Sargent here. It, it, this will give us kind of a final decision on where we are on these things with six more visits. That is what the structural engineer has told me, yes, okay. that this will I'll give second. enough da data for I'll them to make a decision. I'll second. Steve Carmichael. And this six more visits, it's not going to be over like six weeks. This is going to be over. Yes. <laughs> It'll be for three more months. Three months. Okay. Well, with the first... With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. I'm Sergeant. Yes. Thank you. Construction update. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so, as far as construction at the middle school, goes we have wrapped up all the work in the classroom pods and we have moved on into the multi-purpose room but we we were able to work with miss rose to kind of seal that area off from any school traffic we're coming in the back way and we're getting work done ahead of schedule that was originally scheduled to be done in the summer in that multi-purpose room should be completed here within the next 30 days for sure in that area uh, with the exception of the door frames they're going to be installed <clears throat> There are two access door frames that are being installed in order to access that equipment later on whenever you all have to service that equipment or have it removed for whatever reason years down the road. Um, outside of that, really the rest of our work is going to take place during the summer, so we're going to be on, I mean, we'll be around doing any and everything we can possibly do to shorten the summer work if we can get into a room or two. Um, through coordination with Miss Rose, we'll be able to get in there and work on it before summer, but by and large, the rest of our work is gonna start taking place the rest in the summer. Uh, the field has all but <clears throat> wrapped up the lateral lines. The last of the lateral lines were brought out almost to the road today, and then they will be carrying those on again. They'll, they'll get those close to where they're gonna come across, but 
the rest of the work's not going to take place through the summer. We don't want to interrupt the bus traffic and cut that road up or do any of that part right now. Um, so we will be getting topsoil on in the next 30, definitely 15 to 30 days, we'll be getting topsoil down on that field and getting it hydro seeded so we can go ahead and get grass growing on that. Outside of that, um, I don't really have any other construction items as far as an update for what's going on, but we did discuss last month the item of the lighting change order. So we got some more information back from the design team on that. <clears throat> and I know the question was asked if we could potentially reduce the number of lights in the, in the rooms. Uh, one point of clarification that I wanted to make is by and large, well, pretty exclusively all the lighting going in in this area is not, none of it's gonna be in classrooms, it's going to be in administrative areas. That's the area right now that we're taking the ceilings out of, and that's where it was requested to get pricing to replace those lights. As far as reducing the number of lights, um, it wasn't, it, the engineers didn't provide an exact, it's not a cut and dry answer, so to speak. The, if you were to reduce the number of lights, you are increasing the, the voltage and everything coming out of the light and potentially increasing issues with glare because you're putting in that much brighter of a light. In addition to that, <clears throat> you're gonna end up with a lot of cut whips and a lot of cut wires above the ceiling they are gonna now have to be dealt with, taken back to a junction, bo junction box and, and tied up and tidied up. So basically what they had said was they don't think that there would be really a, a net savings by reducing the number of lights and that would probably end up costing about the same by the time you increase the, the voltage of the lights and, and, the, and how bright that particular light is and paid to tie, tie everything up and tidy everything up above ceiling from where you've taken lights out. So that was, the, I think that was the only question we had for a follow up on the lighting. Uh, one other item of note is that in the multi-purpose room, we have not, there's not been any pricing put together just yet, but um, in the multi-purpose room, originally in the plans, there was an access door put in on one side, and on the other side in the mechanical room, it was scheduled to have an existing door frame removed, the units put in there, and that door frame replaced. Whenever we started, and, and we, did, um, we did as much due diligence as we could beforehand to make sure that that plan was gonna work, that plan of attack was gonna work. Um, I had even reached out during the pre-bid to some of the contractors and they, they seemed to assure me that that was going to work. They didn't think there would be any issue. Once the units got on site, it was noted that the, the units, there was no way that, that the catwalk, mm -hmm. it was not the door frame itself or taking any of that out but they did not feel safe to put those units on top of the catwalk given the weight of the unit. So there's going to be a credit change order issued for removing that scope of work, um, but it is gonna net out to a few extra dollars because now they have moved that access door over to the front wall. So as I just wanted to give you all a heads up, there's gonna be some cost involved with that. We are going to work with the contractors to make sure that it stays as minimum as possible and ensure that they give us a correct deduct for the work that they are no longer doing for this other door frame. But I wanted to get that in the back of y'all's head to know that there's something coming for it, just to give you a heads up about it. We just recently found out about it, so we're working through that right now. Okay. Any questions? We have any opinion? Uh, the last thing, do we have any opinion on the lighting change order, or is, do, does the board desire to take a motion on that tonight in any direction? The only reason being for that is, I know last month we said we were approaching the deadline to make sure that everything got here in time to be able to install throughout the summer. Obviously, you all have some other considerations to take into account at this point in time. Yeah. So, uh, I, again, I just, brushing up on that deadline with, Essentially, I, I think we, we got some improved time frames on the, uh, from the supplier on the ship dates for those lights, but I would still say that we're, we're right at that deadline. I'd say that if we couldn't make a decision tonight, we would probably want to defer that. Otherwise, you're, 
you're getting to a point where you may not have the lights in time for school to start. And we don't have that on that. We don't have it on the agenda. Okay. So. Um, and I, if that's something that you all wish to talk about, I know that you were talking about potentially having a special call, if that could be added to that. That's. I am not, we're not trying to push anything one way or the other. But I mean, if we're looking at a special call meeting anyway in the next few weeks, then we then that's when I think we could look at that. But um, I'd like to go to LED, but we need need yeah. to, need on the agenda to do that. But yeah, understood. The balances and save on the so, yeah, let's <clears throat> let's look at that at, at when we look at everything else in special call meeting. So uh, anything else? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Indirect cost for 2024 through 2025, uh, recommend to approve, uh, well, to accept the indirect cost rates for uh, the 12 month period starting July 1st through June 30th. Uh, the non-restricted rate is 12.20% and restricted rate is 2.01%. As you all know, this is an annual request from federal programs, specifically food service program. Um, the, again, amounts are restricted and um, are asked each annual year to be utilized that particular uh, money from uh, indirect cost goes back into the general fund. But again, this is federal. It is outlined with the amount, and it is specific to food service. Any questions? With that, I make a motion. Second, Scott Brown. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins? Yes. Scott Brown? Yes. Steve Carmichael? Yes. James Sargent? Yes. School calendar second reading, 2025 through 2026. Good evening. The, uh, the legwork on this job has pretty much been done. Uh, the committee has brought you a calendar uh, for the 25-26 school year, which you've already read and approved uh, for the first round. The information that you provided with me uh, at our last board meeting was shared with them, and they want to stay with that calendar that you did approve in the first reading. This is the exact same calendar that we reviewed in the first, and we're asking you this evening to Consider that for approval for the 25-26 school year, please. Motion to approve, Steve Carmichael. Second, Scott Brown. With a first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Thank you for all your hard work. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, creation of a five-hour nutrition system. Uh, services team uh, member position at Emma B. Ward, uh, Mr. Ronnie Fields. Yeah, so I've really got to brag on our uh, school nutrition uh, folks, uh, the cooks and the managers, the system managers. Uh, every morning it seems like we start out uh, trying to figure out who's going to be out and where we can shift people around from other schools. They never complain about it. They're always happy to move people around to make sure we've got everything covered. So we're requesting another position at MAB. You all uh, had approved a couple of uh, one-year only positions. Uh, we've done some rounds of interviews. Really nobody's interested in that. Uh, we've got one position at MAB that has been tied up, as you all know, uh, uh, for um, those reasons for uh, a while. So uh, what we're requesting is another five-hour position. Um, right now, MAB Ward uh, is at uh, 18.25 meals per labor hour. The suggestion is between 14 and 18. So uh, we're already working 
uh, at maximum capacity. And uh, so if that other position were to come back, uh, if that person were able to come back, uh, we would still be at 15 uh, point, let's see, 15.84. Uh, so we're still within the range of acceptable uh, staffing on that. Also, uh, next year for CACFP, uh, the MAB Ward daycare is probably our largest daycare, so that would give us some more help there. So just looking at some more ways to make sure that we've got staffing adequate um, right now for this year and then for next year. Second, Steve Carmichael. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Thank you. Shorten school day slash week request. Um, Beth Morgan Cook, uh, Director of Special Ed, requests consideration uh, for a shortened school day slash week for a student. Uh, the request is based upon the recommendation of the individual uh, admission and release uh, committee. Uh, the ARC for the student based on data from the current uh, individual education program and position. Uh, the ARC will continue to address the possibility of the plan for the student's return to a full day. Motion approved, Scott Brown. Second. Steve Carmichael. Go ahead. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Behavioral consultant stipend. Beth Morgan Cook, Director of Special Education, uh, requests the addition of a behavioral consultant stipend for lead behavioral uh, special education teacher uh, at the elementary level. This creation will provide support to teachers with behavioral needs uh, and assist overall as current behavioral consultant position is ending with the funding sunsets. Uh, the proposed stipend is $3,500. Chairman, there is about 13 additional duties um, that is that the $3,500 would help support. I'll read a couple of those just so that you have an idea of the purpose and the reason for the for this particular request. Again, this is for support for teachers, for students that have significant behavior needs. Um, as you all know, we have throughout the course of the year um, requested additional supports, um, but those uh, some of those duties. Um, include provide consultation training and supportive interventions to fellow educators, families, and students to, to affect positive behavior change while complying with federal, state, county, and district policies, procedures, and regulations, at least monthly visits to other units to provide consultation and support, keeping administrators fully informed of intervention activities and concern, uh, ensuring uh, materials are disseminated, um, requesting technical assistance at the school level with the intervention teams for analyzing screening data, identification and implementation of research-based interventions, targeting student needs, including collection and analysis of progress data to determine response to the intervention, uh, collaborating and consulting with staff, um, providing professional development as needed, as well as additional support uh, for design and support implementation of the intervention plans, uh, which also includes data collection, um, to, to, to determine the function of behavior at times, which could uh, potentially be necessary. Uh, again, collaborating with ARC members, helping monitor IEPs, providing recommendations. Um, Ms. Beth Morgan Cook, is there anything, I know I've just really kind of skimmed that. Is there anything you'd like to add to that that I didn't mention? No, you've pretty much hit the highlights. Um, we were able to have a position that did this um, with some of the extra funding, but as that's ending, we're trying to um, still provide those services and provide the support to teachers and students, but try to do it in a little more um, fiscally responsible way as that funding is going away. Just trying to add a stipend for someone already on staff to be able to do that. Thank you, sir. Second, Steve Carmichael. With a first and second. Can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. Same sergeant. Yes. Thank you.
Auditor contract. Uh, consideration to approve the auditor contract for Denise Keene uh, for audit services for the year ending uh, June 30th, 2024. Uh, cost will remain the same at $20,000. Sir, so every year, you know, you have an annual audit contract um, that is required by state law. Um, we have been very blessed to have a different uh, auditors over the course of my 14 uh, tenure years um, as superintendent. Denise um, does specialize in education audits. Um, she is very good. She only t handles um, a small uh, number of school districts. Um, the last time we put the audit out for bid, we did not get any additional audit contract um, service provider that was within the state of Kentucky at the same cost. So the request, again, is to uh, consider to approve this contract for another year um, at the same cost for the benefit of getting one consistency but two um, keeping the cost down and finding a Kentucky education auditor. Any questions around this? I do know that that is one section that um, it seems to be getting less and less uh, even available. Um, I'm, three people in the state doing it. Yeah, it's Motion to approve, Scott Brown. Second, Steve Carmichael. Well, the first and second, can I go to roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Donations over $1,000. Uh, consideration to approve the following donations over $1,000. Century Bank to Anderson County High School football, $2,500. Uh, Home and Memorial Trust Fund uh, to Backpack Buddies of $2,000. Smith Contracting to Anderson County, foot, or Anderson County High School football of $1,000. Approved, Scott Bram. Second, Steve Carmichael. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Purchases over ten thousand uh, dollars. Consideration to approve the purchases over ten thousand. Um, looks like we only have one. Uh, Eleven HP workstations and monitors for uh, CTE. Uh, using uh, LVEC funds uh, in the amount of $19,096. Are there any questions regarding this request? This is specific for Anderson County High School Career and Technical Education Program. This is lay -VEC, um, uh funding, which is uh, supported by uh, Carl Perkins. Mr. Jury, do you have anything you'd like to add around? Uh, no, for the, these are for our engineering classroom. We added 15 last year. The numbers are growing in those classes. And so we've, we added 15 last year new ones. We had some older ones outfitted. So this is just an addition to that. Uh, so we can have more students uh, continue with the CTE classes. I, I can tell you myself, I, I really support those engineering classes and, and everything that I've went and uh, seen them myself. You know, they're phenomenal. Um, uh, I make a motion to approve. Thank you. I made a motion. Second, Scott Brown. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Yes. Granite Government Solutions, um, CO Blake Drury to request. Uh, is requesting to contract with Granite for a solution that, to move all remaining uh, telco utilized by the district uh, to a managed cellular solution. Uh, there is no cost to implement and estimated savings for the general fund are approximately $50,000 per year. Uh, the request of the board uh, approval uh, pending board attorney approval uh, the contract, uh, Granite is on the uh, Amelia Partners uh, Cooperative Vendor List. 
So basically, as we'll see in the technology plan that I do next, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is to get away from analog, uh, you know, traditional copper analog lines. And so this would actually take us out of that. It would, would completely, completely remove us from that. Uh, the estimated savings currently is about 50000 a year, um, although the cost of those copper lines, about every three months we get a letter of, you know, how much that's raising. So uh, it's, it's a significant change, and I think it, it's, it falls in line with what we need to do. Um, and, and also it allows us to still have those lines for uh, alarms, fire alarms, elevators. Uh, it's just a different system. I, I will say that I, I'm very familiar with Granite myself and the work that they've done in quite a few places. Um, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there, so. Is there any specific concerns that you could have at all? No. no, I mean, honestly, this, you know, we've moved away from, from these for our telco uh, already. We're going to ho hosted voice several years ago. Uh, most recently, last year, we moved away on our fax solution. Uh, so we, we've moved away and we've had success moving away. I, that, that's pretty much the way they're going. Uh, people are moving away from those traditional copper lines, and eventually those will be phased out. The, this is the way that normal businesses is, are, are done, so. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what, so this Epic is a, basically like a cellular solution. So instead of having a POTS line come in, um, we would have a cellular, a cellular uh, place at each station that, that ran those lines. Motion approved, Scott Bram. Second, Jason Collins. With first and second, can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. Yes. Scott Brown. Yes. Steve Carmichael. Yes. James Sargent. Technology plan update. All right, so uh, you know, each year we have a technology plan that we present to the state. Uh, the Kentucky is actually pretty unique in that we have a Kentucky educational technology system. We have a unified system at the state level. So uh, the state has a, a CATS master plan that we follow. And so each district um, turns in a plan that, that is in line with that state master plan. So this is, this is our plan. Each year we make adjustments to it. So what I've done is I've given you the entire plan but I've gone through and just uh, pulled some highlights. Um, <clears throat> from the last plan, goals met, uh, the network upgrade, so we had that, and basically anything that we wanna do technology-wise needs to be in this plan. Doesn't necessarily mean that we will do it, but anything that we plan to do has to be in here and it has to line out with the state master plan. Um, so um, goals met through the last uh, technology plan, network upgrade to include more dense wireless, improved network monitoring uh, through MIBS, uh, maintaining student-computer ratio of one-to-one -one or greater, continuing to monitor and improve the network to ensure uptime for users, uh, continued support of STLP in all schools. You heard about some of our STLP uh, students um, winning at the state, so that, that's exciting. Uh, limited reliance on copper, that's the one that hopefully we're, we're about to uh, completely um, move away from. Expanded technology district professional development offerings and implementing an internal technology internship and student help desk program at our high school. So we've had student interns for the last few years and last year we finally got our help desk um, up and going. So now we have students fixing our Chromebooks, doing a lot of that work. So we're not ship shipping it out, we're doing a lot of that work in house. <clears throat> and the students are, are learning and it's, they get a class credit for that. Um, <clears throat> areas of improvement. One of the things we wanna do is we wanna gather more robust student voice data. So currently we're using our student, uh, our student workers, getting their input on this plan, but I want to get a, a little more data from just our end user students. So that's one of the things we're gonna work on next year is to get a little bit better um, data from our end user students. Uh, and then incorporate net, uh, networking technology skills pathway into the high school program. So we've been talking with the teachers there. We've uh, added cybersecurity. We just talked about the engineering. And so one of the big areas that we could, uh, and, and we have some vendor partners that can really help us out with this um, economically, is to look into adding some um, networking skills as well. So we're going to be working with the program just to try to add that. So I've added that into the plan. 
um, needs that emerge after the last plan. Basically, uh, biggest biggest uh, elephant in the room at, in all the school districts is, is post ESSER. Uh, how are you going to continue one to one? So. Uh, the state master plan calls for one-to-one -one be uh, mainly because of testing. So state testing is moving more and more to online testing. Um, and over the last several years, we've utilized ESSER funds to have a one-to-one, -to, -one, to have a computer in every student's hand. Um, we've been creative over the last few years to be able to try to continue that um, and, and save uh, not spend not spend as much because you you know normally normally you would have to for a rotation buy two class sets of Chromebooks each year to have a classroom have a, a set in every student's hand. So we're working on that, but and, and it's really um, the big thing we want to want y'all to understand is this has to be curriculum driven. So it's not the technology department saying we need to have all these computers. So we're going back and we're working in our PLCs with principals to, to determine. Really, what do you need? What does it look like? And then when we come back, that's what we're going to come back with, is what our teachers and our principals say that they need as far as technology in their classrooms. <clears throat> um, another big area is growing need for enhanced cybersecurity. Uh, so we're looking at some, so Homeland Security has a program that we're going to work with. Uh, but um, I see Jason shaking his head. He works in cybersecurity. But that, that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we talked about uh, this year was the enhanced need for cybersecurity. Over the last several years, we've, we've added insurance for, for uh, cybersecurity. So that's just something that, that we want to move into the realm of having some testing done by Homeland Security so that we're monitored and, and we make sure that we're in good shape. Uh, and then the last one is what we just talked about, the elimination of uh, the reliance on traditional analog copper lines. So that, that's in a nutshell, those are the big changes, the things we've done, and then the things we're looking to adjust in the future. I will say the the homeland security one, it's tough. Yeah. They do they do a really thorough job, and it's free. So, no, you will not have fun. So yeah, that's what I was talking about is the one-to-one. The -one. So what we've done this year is at our high schools, we've traditionally sent them home and they keep them for the summer. And so this year we have now started taking those up as we reach the end of the year and we're moving those into carts. And so, and Mr. Glass can speak to this. This was a decision we uh, made, we came to at the high school level with the high school students as far as how that's going to work. They have a plan moving into next year uh, to be able to uh, have those for the students that need to take them home to be able to check them out, but not provide them to every student to take home every night. Um, and again, that, that's one of the things, you know, we could, we could go either way on that, but when we come back, if we want to continue with that, uh, if you remember, I, I think that the last year the number was about $300,000. And so that, you know, if we want to continue with that, that's what the hit on our budget will be. That's been coming out of ESSER funds, um, but each year, that's been coming out of ESSER funds. And so with ESSER funds coming to the end, that's what I was talking about there is we have to determine what we want to do. So that's how we're adjusting to it now. So they, are they taking them home during the regular school period or? So at the high school they've, they didn't give me details. yeah, at the high school they've taken them home all year and now we're starting to collect them, put them into carts. And so the model moving into next year will be that teachers have them in their classrooms for use during the day and for testing, and that those for students that are in BCTC, and, and Chris, you can pipe in on this if you want, students that are in BCTC classes, AP classes, or that have the need can still check one out, uh, like they would check it out from the library, like you would check out a textbook or anything else, but it wouldn't be just automatically given to every student that comes in. It would be needs-based. Um, the students that needed one, they would have to sign a contract, and, and get that. When you're not milking cows, you don't need a Chromebook. Yeah. Well, I didn't know what they were talking about, so I don't know. Then when they, they asked me the question, they said, well, if they're not going to use a Chromebook, then it's going to create more work and more expense for the teachers to have to make copies and paper of that. You know, and take home packages. Well, so, and, that, and that's true, so it is, it's a different look at teaching. Um, not, that wasn't all, you know, based on technology, some of it's based on budget, and you all understand, you know, there's a limited amount of money, there's, you know, a piece of pie, and you cut out those pieces, and, it, you know, that's all you have. 
but uh, it was also curriculum based. And so a lot of the teachers, you know, through COVID, we had to really rely on sending students home with the ability to maybe stay home for a week and try to teach remotely. And so that, that's not the, the most effective way to teach. And so our teachers want our kids in the classroom, want our kids in, in school learning, and they're wanting to move kind of to some of those uh, other more traditional methods of teaching. So it's, it's a blended approach. It's not all online, not everything there. There's times when it's necessary. There are times when it's more effective. There are also times, I'm sure, in language arts, Ms. Davis, that you would rather throw the Chromebook out and, and have them sit down and write something. So... <laughs> Mr. Har Mr. I, Harley can you know, probably correct me on this, but I think we're down, if you want to tell him, we're down over a million clicks on our printer. So that's 500 sheets of paper, a million sheets of paper, however you look at it, one, one side or double sided or more, right? Do you know? I would just, you know, when you go in, oh, the Mr. Harley. I also do know that there was, I will say that some some students that are able to afford their own uh, device, they prefer their own device. Yeah. So that and Chromebook, so if it was sent home with them, it's basically it going to sit in the corner. Yeah. And so you know, that's one of the things we've always maintained to bring your own device. And so our network is still ready for bring your own device. And so we have a lot of students that, that actually through COVID, we would say, you know, certain classes, they would want them to not bring their own device when they had a device that was much more robust than what we were handing out um, because they were doing certain things. And so now we're wanting to be a little more uh, device agnostic and be able to work with any student's device, no matter what it is. Yeah, and we've maintained that, and so we're able to continue with that, and we have a lot of students that, that would prefer that. And so that, and that's what that allows. It allows students to do that, but we also are still going to have that for those students that are in need. Appreciate it. Next is fundraiser request, uh, South Street Elementary uh, request permission for candy sale fundraiser uh, during their movie day on May 15th, 2024. Uh, proceeds will benefit the PTO general fund for students and staff needs. Second, Steve Carmichael. With the first and second, can I get a roll call vote please? Yes, sir, Jason Collins. <laughs> yes. Scott Brown? Yes. Steve Carmichael? Yes. Same sergeant? Yes. And Scott wants to know what kind of candy. But. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. Second, Steve Carmichael. With a first and second. Can I get a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. Jason Collins? Yes. Scott Brown? Yes. Steve Carmichael? Yes. Same sergeant? We are adjourned. <laughs>